Thank you all for that. We've got, we've got a lot still yet to happen in this service, um, so I will be brief, but I want to walk with you through this story that we just heard. We heard the introduction to the story. Um, Becky's a librarian, so she can handle the hard words, but I didn't want you to have to read a whole chapter. So we're going to walk through this story of Lydia and Paul. Uh, so that's Acts 16. If you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. We'll be starting at verse 11. And like we heard it read, this is a scene where Paul is coming. He's got some companions with him. He's got a guy named Silas. Um, he's, just, he's just met Timothy, who is also kind of a Bible-famous person. He's just split with Barnabas, who we learned about last week. Uh, he comes to Macedonia, to this area uh, that is outside of the normal bounds of Judaism. It's, um, he's traveling into Greek territory. And he travels to this place and instantly starts causing trouble. And so that is what we will look at this morning as we continue this series looking at what are disciples. We ask ourselves, disciples are blank. So in week one, we said that um, it's just a thing that we are. It's not this like list of rules or requirements. It's just something that we embody. And then we started exploring what are those things we embody. And we said that the things we embody are, last week we talked about generosity. We Disciples are generous. Um, just a, a simple thing like that. This week we are saying disciples are in love with God. And so as we explore that. I invite you to look at Acts chapter 16. I'm going to walk through the story. I won't read it, but I invite you to read along. So they show up at this town called Philippi. We know this town called Philippi most likely from the letter Philippians um, or from like Philippatch. Either way, um, Philippi. And so they come to this town Philippi and they are looking. Paul often, he'll show up at a town and he'll try to go to a synagogue. He'll show up and he'll try to meet with the Jewish believers there. And so similarly, he shows up, he's in Macedonia, and he goes to where he thinks there's going to be a synagogue. And it's on the outskirts of town, but instead of finding an established worship center, he finds a few ladies who have gathered. Um, and it seems as though, maybe I'm reading into this, but it seems as though in Acts 16 that Paul's almost a little dismissive of this gathering um, because it's not a uh, normal looking synagogue. It doesn't have the pomp and circumstance you would expect, but it tells us that, that there are some women who are gathered there, one of them being Lydia. Um, Lydia, this God-fearing woman, this person that has a deep faith already, and so they're there and they're praying, and Paul comes and begins to teach them about Jesus, and Lydia believes. Something in her stirs, and she believes in Jesus, and already right there, we're starting to be reminded of some things. Um, because when I say that disciples are in love with God, what I'm ultimately going to be doing this morning is we're going to be talking about spiritual practices. We're going to be talking about, um, it's like my tricky way of talking about like reading the Bible, praying, going to worship, um, spiritual practices. But it's a reminder that so often the reason why spiritual practices don't catch on in our lives is because we think they have to look a certain way. Um, we think they have to be a certain thing. They almost become a badge of honor in themselves. And so you have people that are like, like people are like trying to like out spiritual practice you. Like they'll be like, well, I've read the Bible all the way through 10 times and you've only read it four. So like I'm a better Christian than you. None of y'all, I'm sure. Um, I have met those people before. Or like, well, I pray three times a day. So like I am holy and devout. I know what I'm doing. It becomes this, this, this rite of passage. And then also it becomes this way to say, well, the way I read the Bible is right compared to the way you read the Bible. It becomes this like this moniker of pride. And so already early in this story, we're being reminded that the point of doing spiritual practices, the point of reading the Bible, the point of gathering together to pray, the point of worship, we don't read the Bible because the Bible is God. We read the Bible because the Bible helps connect us to God. Everything we're talking about this morning, all of these spiritual practices, their points is so that we might stay in love with God. It's about relationship. It's about connecting us with God. So we don't need to get caught in the weeds of, am I doing this exactly right? Because the real question is, is it helping me stay in love with God? All right? And I just one more time need to say, this is not God. This is just a way for us to interact with God. And so Paul comes and he meets these women and they're praying by this river. And it maybe doesn't look like what he expects, 
but clearly these people are here and they are in love with God. We know that about Lydia. And so Lydia hears the word and is stirred inside and says, yeah, I believe. Done. You've convinced me. It's easy. I already have this relationship with God, and so I feel God's prompting me um, absolutely. And then Lydia instantly starts exhibiting the characteristics of discipleship that we've already talked about in our series. Lydia, I guess, listens to our sermon podcast because she just knew instantly um, she started showing generosity. She said, come, stay at my house. Come, stay with me. Eat my food. Drink my water. Um, I will provide for you. She also begins telling people about her experience. That's what we did in week two, as we said, disciples are storytellers. She goes home, and her entire household converts to Christianity, because she tells all of them, look at what I have experienced. Listen to this thing that I have seen, this spirit that I felt. And so her whole household begins to believe in Jesus. And so they gather together, um, and, and they're hanging out with Paul, and Paul is going around town, and it says, we, we enter into this new phase of the story. Um, we're going to move away from Lydia and then come back. Uh, Paul and Silas are wandering around, and while they're doing stuff, this girl, it says there's a slave girl who is possessed by a spirit that allows her to see the future, is the way it's described. And so she um, helps her, fa- her, her owners, she helps her owners make money. Um, she, like, is a fortune teller for money. And there, she's falling around Paul, and she's just proclaiming this truth. She's just saying, this is who Paul is for several days. And I love it. Eventually, Paul just gets annoyed with her. And so it's not that he, like, has compassion in his heart. Um, it's not that he's like, oh, this poor person. He's like, oh, would you please just be quiet? And so he heals her because um, it's Paul. You know, he's always causing a little bit of problems. He heals her. And everybody in town, the, the people who own this slave girl get mad because she is property to them. She is a way to make money to them. Um, and so they get mad because, because the system has changed and they can't make money off of this slave girl anymore. Um, and so they get frustrated and they go and they get the town all riled up and, and Paul and Silas gets thrown into jail. It's a reminder that when we are in love with God, sometimes the world doesn't quite understand um, because When you're in love with God, that means you're also loving for God's creation. This is going to be a whole whole separate sermon, but it means that you love God's creation. And so sometimes it means that you disrupt the systems that are oppressing God's creation, just like Paul did with this slave girl. He changed the dynamics and the people were mad because for them it wasn't about being in love with God. It was about maintaining the status quo. And so they get thrown in jail. And while they're in jail, uh, it says that, that they are gathered there and they begin worshiping. They begin singing songs and they begin praying and all the other prisoners are listening. Like they're having, they're having a prison revival. Um, like they get Johnny Cash to come and they, he sings some blues with them. Like they're having a prison revival. Everybody's celebrating and, and this earthquake happens. Um, it, it, it's this miraculous scene. And again, it's this reminder. We're talking about spiritual practices this morning. And so as we talk about spiritual practices, we remember the spiritual practices, they, they don't always look a certain polished way because they're about being in love with God. It's also the reminder that at times in our life, we rely on spiritual practices even when we feel entirely hopeless and alone, even when our world is falling apart. You see, Paul and Silas, they're locked into this prison. They're they're trapped. They've just been beaten. They've been flogged, and they're trapped, and it doesn't look good for them, and yet they still turn to worship prayer. They still have hope. They still sing joyfully. And as you're reading this, like logically, that doesn't make sense. Logically, when they're in prison is the time that they lose hope. But I understand this because I felt this. At times that I've been lowest in my life, when I turn to God, I feel closest to God. When everything's going good, it doesn't always happen. But when you're in those pits of despair, when you don't know what to do, when when your job is driving you crazy, when your family is a wreck, when there's someone who's sick and you just wish they would be healed, when you don't know where to turn, when you have money woes, when you're struggling with addiction and you don't know how to claw yourself out, whatever the thing is, when you turn to God in those moments, you feel so close. This is the reminder that our spiritual practices permeate and penetrate even the darkest parts of our lives. Spiritual practices aren't just for when things are going good. They're especially for when things are going bad. Because we're in love with God no matter what. And so Paul and Silas, they're gathered and they're they're singing and they're praying. And they're in love with God and they're doing these spiritual practices at this, this moment of despair. And it says there's this earthquake. 
And so the prison gets broken open, and there's this weird scene. I don't know why the jailer reacts this way, but the jailer's like, oh, no, clearly there's been this earthquake. People have escaped. I don't know. Maybe he was at the prison convention, and he heard another guy talking about how Peter escaped from a jail, and he's like, this is just what Christians do. I don't know if they had prison conventions back then. Maybe he's just kind of a worrier, and so he just always assumes the worst. I don't, I don't know why this is his jump, but he hears this and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to fall on my sword. I'm like, clear, this is just over. Um, it's like when you drop something, you're like, well, done, my day's ruined. Um, he decides my, my life is over. And in this moment, Paul and Silas show hope to him. They say, no, wait, we're still here. We haven't run away yet. We're having a, we're having a revival. We haven't passed the plates late. You're good. We're still here. Um, and so, so they say, no, don't come hang out with us. And they begin to talk to the jailer and they, they tell him about Jesus, and he converts to Christianity, and his whole household does too, so they keep the party going, and they're all celebrating and hanging out. Now they're at the jailer's house. Um, We now have two houses in Philippi that are Christian households, and they're hanging out, and they're excited, and in the morning, um, they get word that, that it's okay. Paul and Silas can be let out of jail, and they're free to go, and the jailer says, well, this is convenient. You guys are free to go, even though you're already just hanging out in my living room. Um, And they say, that's awesome. And then there's this weird moment that happens that, again, like, it's just, this is classic Paul. There's this weird moment that happens. After all of this has happened, Paul says, oh, well, that's cute. Um, But they're going to need to come walk me out of town because they, how dare they treat a Roman citizen that way? And now this is subtle. This is like, we don't appreciate this, but like, that's a mic drop moment. It's like, it's like he's on undercover boss and he just revealed he's the CEO, you know? It's like in the country songs, whenever at the end of the song, it's like, oh, by the way, those, that, that like prostitute and preacher, those were my parents. Like that's, it's one of those moments um, in this story. He says, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. And that matters because Roman citizens have certain privileges. You don't mess with Roman citizens. There's a certain way that you handle it. Um, And we are in a Greek province, and so some people in this town probably are not Roman citizens. And so in some regards, Paul has more authority than even some of them as this stranger because he's a Roman citizen, and you don't want to make them mad. And so they start realizing, okay, so we just like basically did a sham trial and beat a Roman citizen. We're in trouble. And so they're like, we are so sorry. This is a disaster. Um, Classic Paul stirring up trouble at the very end. Um, But he's like, gotcha. And then they start wandering out of town. And I love, this is my favorite part of this story, especially with spiritual practices. And he says, on our way out, let's stop back by Lydia's house um, because we just want to make sure we know who our associates are so you can be mad at them too. I don't know why Paul did it, but it's Paul. Um, And so they stop by back, back by Lydia's house and it says, where the brothers and sisters are gathered. Here's what I love about this story. All while Paul and Silas are having their prison revival, apparently Lydia's been building a house church. Because by the time Paul gets out of prison, they've got a gathered worshiping congregation happening in Lydia's house. In one week, she has proselytized like half of the town. I don't know how many people, but a lot of people. I also love it because I love this story, especially because some people still don't think that women can preach the gospel. And it's like, You've clearly not read Acts. Um, But she's built this house church. And how has she built this house church? Because she's continued to pray and to worship and be devoted to the scripture and to stay in love with God. It wasn't this momentary conversion thing. It wasn't like, oh, I met this weird guy down by a river. He stayed in my house for a few days and now, okay. No, her life is different now. It has changed. And so she's building this church, and we know that this is an incredible, life-changing moment because later, like I said, Paul's going to write a letter to him. Paul's going to write the church in Philippi that started in Lydia's living room. He's going to write the church in Philippi, and he's going to thank them for their financial contributions to his mission, the fact that they continued being generous disciples. He's going to write them, and he's going to tell them how impressed he is with their faith and with their conviction and love for God. Paul's going to write them and say, look at this beautiful thing that you have built in this town that when I showed up, I said, this is what you call a synagogue? The entire town Nay, the entire world is changed because these people's commitment to staying in love with God, Lydia's commitment, Paul's commitment, Silas's commitment, the jailer's commitment, all of these people's commitment to staying in love with God, to practicing the things that they know will bring them close to who 
God is, that is what disciples are. We have a, a story full of examples of discipleship. That is what disciples are, is they are people that stay in love with God. And so the question is, how do we stay in love with God? I keep using this word, spiritual practices. What does that mean for us today, gathered this morning? Um, at Faith, we actually have helped ourselves out a little bit. We've defined some. Um, does anybody offhand, we got enough time for this, does anybody offhand, can they tell me what our six core practices are? At Faith Baptist Church, we several years ago sat down and said, here are these six things that we can do that we think will help us stay in love with God. It's not an exhaustive list, but here's some things we can do. Does anybody remember what our six core practices are? Corporate worship, what we're doing right now. I was going to say, we're going to have to have a new sermon series on this. Um, corporate worship right now, the fact we commit ourselves to gathering weekly for worship, um, not on our own, but as a group. We believe in community. We believe in coming together to proclaim God's name, just like they did in prison and in Lydia's house. Anybody remember another one? Personal worship. Because it's, it's not just the Sunday morning. It's every other day, too. It's the fact that, that I guess, I imagine, this is just William hypothesizing, that every day that Lydia went to wash cloth, she was praying. It wasn't just on the Sabbath. So it's our commitment to personal times with God. Anybody else remember another one? Stewardship. Yeah. Disciples are generous. Um, it's us acknowledging that we are going to give um, we are going to give financially to support this church, but also just to support the kingdom of God broadly. Um, we are willing to give. Anybody remember another one? Shared concern. Yeah, shared. I think I call that, my, my like William word for that is shared life. This idea that we're going to do life together. We're going to care when each other are sad or happy. We're going to be concerned when someone else is concerned. When you're going through a tough time, I'm going through a tough time right along with you. And when you're really excited, I'm really excited along with you. We're doing life together. Anybody remember another one? We're at what, four, six, two-thirds. What? Fellowship. Is, no, I don't think that's one of them. That's awkward. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, Christian education. Yeah, we have Christian education. We say it's important for us not just to worship, but to learn, to study. So we get together as groups and primarily on Sunday morning and Sunday school or Wednesday night in Bible study, and we talk about scripture, we talk about um, events, we talk about what's going on in our lives. We say as Christians, we're committing to exploring the, the knowledge part of our faith, to learning together. Anybody remember the last one? So we have corporate worship, personal worship, stewardship. Um, we have... We have Christian education, shared life. Anybody remember the last one? Service. service. It's something y'all are really good at. Service, missions. It's not just that we're going to give our money. It's that we're going to give our time, our energy. We're going to show up. We're going to care. Y'all are really good at this service part. Someone's hungry, we're going to feed them. Someone is thirsty, we're going to give them something to drink. Someone's naked, we're going to clothe them. You know, the stuff like Jesus told us to care about. We actually listened, um, or we try to. Um, service. We're not just going to care about our own internal community. We're going to care about the community because we are all part of the body of Christ. That is, is one way that we as a church have said, this is a way to stay in love with God, is to practice these core practices, this communal worship, personal worship, um, study, de generosity, service, and shared life. These things that we, we say, if, if we do this, we will stay in love with God. And, and it doesn't look the exact same for everybody. Your version of study might look a little bit different than mine. But, but the key is, is that to stay in love with God, just like with any other relationship, we devote time. We devote energy. We devote concern and compassion to God. We set aside time to say, yeah, even though it's a beautiful rainy day on Sunday morning, I'm going to go do worship because I'm committed to staying in love with with God. That is part of what it looks like when we are gathered here. Um, but like I, like I said, and like I say all throughout this series, is we don't think of this list as like, a, here's these check marks, and if I just do this, then everything's fine. It all comes just from this inner welling up of, I am a disciple. I can't help but love God. Um, and to illustrate that, I have a final story for you, and then we'll move on with life. Um, but something that has struck me recently since 
we, it's been over a year now when we had our discernment conversation and we adopted our statement of welcome on how welcoming we'd be for people in the LGBTQ community. Since then, I have had several people come and have a very similar conversation with me. Um, normally, it's either like a college student at Georgetown College or a younger person in their 20s, but they'll hear about our, ch- our church or they'll hear, um, they'll hear that there's this crazy Baptist pastor that doesn't hate them, um, and they will come and they'll say, I want to talk to you about it. Um, and so we'll sit down and we'll have coffee, and oftentimes these conversations will go a very similar way. Um, there's one in particular that I'm thinking of. She was 22 years old. She's a senior at Georgetown College. This was not this year. She's not currently a senior at Georgetown College. Um, and she came and said, I all my life have been gay. I just know it. I can't. I went through high school. I prayed to not be. I was desperate to be straight, and I just wasn't. I just couldn't do it. It's just who I am, and I just don't know what to do because my family and my home church and everyone in my life tells me that like I can't, I can't be gay and love God. They just say it's incompatible. And she said, I just don't know what to do because I can't, I can't help, I can't help who I'm attracted to, and I also can't help that I desperately love God. She said, I feel both in my soul so strongly, and so I don't know how to reconcile that because I can't change either one. I can't just stop being in love with God. I so just want a place that I can explore this and learn this and feel this connection to God, but I don't know where that is and I don't know what that looks like and I don't know what to do about that personally. Um, And so as we're talking, I say something like, look, you're gay, like God loves you. And she said, that's the first time anyone out loud has said that. You're gay, God loves you. The first time, and she's 22 years old, but yet, Despite the fact that she's rejected by her family, despite the fact that she's rejected by her home church, despite the fact that she's rejected by every single person in her life, she cannot help but be in love with God. Everything in her life says, just give up. Just turn away from the church. Just give up on God. It's more harm than it is good. And she says, I can't help it because it's real to me. That is being in love with God. That is being a disciple that is in love with God. It is not the list I have to go through. It's not the the obligations I have to show up for. It's the deep urging and burning in my soul that says, I just have to be a part of this group so that I can just continue to learn and grow and worship. I can't help but be close to my creator. We see that in Lydia. We see that in Paul. We see this, this, this urging to do everything they can to be in love with God. And so that is what you are invited into as disciples. That is what you're invited into, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much, um, how much the world doesn't get you, no matter how much you feel like you're in the depths of despair, you are invited into this, this unquenchable love of God. Because being a disciple is being in love with God. If you would, pray with me. God, I am so thankful for you. I'm so thankful that the God who cares about Lydia and the God who cares about Paul and the God who cares about my LGBTQ friends and the God who cares about me still loves us. God, I'm so thankful that you show up in our lives every day and I just pray that you might help us to stay focused and stay committed and just stay in love with you. We need you, God, now and always. In your name we pray. Amen.